and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. We as the Lord's church, we have that grave responsibility to tell those people who are not Christians today that Jesus is the answer. Oh, that their word, it's like the word Christian. It's been said so much and used in so many ways that it doesn't sound like it matters anymore. Everybody uses it. Even, even those who are lost and know it, those who love darkness rather than light, use that their statement. And it's been used so much that people don't look at it anymore. But I believe we as the Lord's church have the responsibility that not only speak it, but let it show in our lives that we truly believe that Jesus is the King of kings, Lord of lords. And when we make that statement, now folks, listen. When we make that statement, we're saying that we believe that Jesus is alive and He is true and He is faithful and there is no other King than Jesus. He is the Lord of our life. He's the King of our life. And when people look at the church, they ought to see a church a people who identify with the Bible and not with the world. That the world needs to hear that. People are dying now as we speak. All over the world people are dying. You can look at the paper and the radio and the internet, the TV and look into the obituaries. And people are dying every day, every day, and every day without Jesus Christ. Them are people that God loves that are dying without Jesus Christ. Them are people that Jesus died for that are dying without Him. Jesus died for us too. We've already been given the opportunity to obey the gospel. We've already been given the opportunity to remain faithful unto death. We've already been given the promise. We have a right now to be a part of God's kingdom. We have the promise when Jesus comes back that He'll take us home with Him. But not everyone has that promise in this world. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility to tell them. We need to tell our neighbors we need to tell our brothers and sisters, our moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews. We need to tell our bosses at work, our husbands and wives, and our own children. Because Jesus is going to come back. And the only thing that's going to go with Him into this eternal kingdom is His church. Everything else is going to be lost and destroyed and go to hell and burn in the lake of fire for all eternity. That's why it's so important for us to let Jesus do the building. It needs to be the church that He builds. And the question this morning for us, is Jesus building my life as a Christian? Is Jesus building my life as being a part of the church, the body of Christ? Is Jesus out in front of me, leading me, making the decisions for me through His Word and the Holy Spirit? Is Jesus the King of my life in every way? In the actions that I do, the things that I say, in the way that I think, is Jesus the King of my life? If He is not my friend in everything, when Jesus returns to pick up His church, we won't be in it. We won't be in the church. We won't be in that great gathering in the air, be it the Lord forevermore. That's why it's so important to let Jesus do the building. I don't want to go build a house for somebody. I have no business building a house for somebody because I just don't know how. But Jesus knows how to build a church. Okay? That's why we need to let Him do the building. Is Jesus building your life as a Christian this morning? Is He making the difference in your life? 
Paul spoke unto the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm telling you, Jesus had the characteristics of his Father in heaven. He was his Son. And every person, including the apostles, were sons of God. You and I this morning, the Bible says that we are sons and daughters of God. And we know that our children has at least some characteristics of us. Mom and Dad. Yeah, they either look like them or they act like them, talk like them, whatever. When James talks to somebody on the phone, people have to distinguish, is that James or is that Jay? Because he sounds like me on the phone. He has that characteristic. We are sons and daughters of the Almighty God and we should have the characteristics of our Father in Heaven. And Paul had the characteristics of his Father in Heaven. He had one of the characteristics of being patient and long-suffering. Let's read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting with verse 1. And I, Paul said, brethren, he's talking to the church, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. In 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 2, the Bible says, As babes in Christ, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And as was Paul was doing to the church at Corinth and in his early infancy, if you want to call it that, he was feeding the milk of the word. He dare not give them the meat of the word as of yet because it would choke them. But yet they were on the milk of the word and they were not able to bear the meat even as he spoke and taught them. There was a reason for that. In every chapter of 1 Corinthians, I know we've talked about this. In every chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul dealt with a different problem in the church. And see, they'd, they'd uh, overcome one problem, there'd be another one. Overcome one problem, there'd be another one. Overcome that, be another one. All the way up to chapter 16. But in sec the second letter of Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, he commended the church for overcoming the problems he was dealing with. Now think about that a minute. Most of Paul's life, he was dealing with problems in the church. Writing letters to them. Helping them overcome. And the church of Corinth did. But had Paul not been a patient man, if Paul had not been long-suffering, as is his characteristics of his Father in Heaven, he would not have wrote them a second letter and commended them. Because these people would have never escaped their infancy as a Christian. But Paul was long-suffering. If you can go over to um, 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> and verse 9. The Apostle Peter, the inspired writer of the Holy Spirit, speaking to the church in general, said these words. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long-suffering. Do don't you think that He sees all the doom and gloom, the sin, the evil, and the wickedness in this world? Don't you think that He sees that when He gave His Son Jesus to die on the cross and all the people are still mocking Him in this world? They're still trying to crucify the Son of God afresh? Yes, God sees that. And the Bible has taught from the Old Testament to the New that God stores up wrath in Romans chapter 1 against all ungodliness and unrighteousness against Him. He is storing up wrath. There will be a day come when God will explode in His wrath against those who will not obey the gospel. Thessalonians says they'll come taking vengeance with a flaming sword 
to those who obey not the gospel of God and know not God. Yes, he's going to explode. And he has every right to. You ever been in a position where you just, you took, you have taken all you could take and it just happened, you just exploded, let it out? I've been there. I've done that. That's the way God's going to be. He's not going to take any more at some particular time point. But Paul had the characteristics of God, his long suffering. God doesn't want any to perish. That's why the world's still going. He's given everyone the opportunity. All the evil people in the world is given the opportunity right now to get it right. Every day that goes by, it's God giving it. So every wicked person can get it right. Days aren't just passing by because we have a calendar. It's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then we can count 2016, 2017, 2018, etc., etc., etc. God is giving every day for the purpose that every person can get it right. That's why it's still going on. Okay? It's not going on so I can go to work in the morning. It's not going on so uh, this mother can have a child. It's not going on because decisions can be made. It's going on for the wicked, the lost, the souls that are not come to Christ yet. So they can get it right. It's important that we let Jesus through the building. Paul teaches in a way... You know, I, 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 uh, we, we talk a lot about studying the Word... Or we partake the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And you hear it so much, and you hear it so much, and you hear it so much. And sometimes people say, I'd like to see or hear something new. And there are people out here in the denominational world that says, I like a new sermon every Sunday. I like to hear something new. Well, my friends, there's nothing new. We have the complete written will of God. This is all that there is. You're not going to get nothing new. And Peter says in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, Peter says, This second epistle, or this second letter, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Or in other words, by reminding you of, you of things that you already know. That's what the Bible's all about. is reminding of things that we already know. And so that's what uh, Paul's doing back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He's reminding these people of things they already know. We read all that, that, these chapters in 1 Corinthians over and over again. And sometimes we can uh, got these things in our minds and we can quote it by, by heart because we've read it so much. Well, that's the way God wants it. And that's what Paul's doing here. He said, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For well, whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, another I am of Paulus, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Yes, we're all ministers. We're all servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're seed planters. Every one of us has been given the job by our Lord to plant seeds in someone's heart. Now, it's not our job to make them come to, to the assembly. It's not our job to pull them from this life and into the next. That's God's job. He gives the increase. We're just to plant seeds and we're to water it. And then God will do the building or Jesus will build his church. See, they were having problems there in that congregation. You know, some of them were putting Apollos on a pedestal and Paul on a pedestal. And there were friction there. Paul was greater than Apollos, or Apollos was greater than Paul. And not only that, they were saying, what I think is more important than what that person thinks. 
You see, I've got more wisdom than that person. And there was fighting and envy and, and envy going on in the church. We know what envy means. Envying other people. Yeah. And the Bible says in James that where envy and strife is, is every wicked work. He's talking about in the church. Now, we may not see that happening sometimes, but that how, that's how deceiving the devil is. We don't see it coming. So we have to be careful that that's not happening here. And verse 7, So then neither is he that planteth anything. Wow. I take that as a compliment. I'm not anything. Okay? But some people, if you say you're not anything, they would, they would take it to heart. But in this text, you know, I'm relieved that God put me in a position not to be anything. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are labors together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. The church collectively is God's building, God's husbandry. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. What if I said that? What kind of response would I get from you? I'm a wise master builder. Well, I think you all know me well enough that that's not true. <laughs> okay? But Paul said that of himself. He's a wise master builder. Why? Now listen, folks. Because he let Jesus do the building. He let Jesus do the building. In other words, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I, but Christ liveth in me. And we need to be saying that as Christians. I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I, but Christ liveth in me. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man or woman take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, or anything else, every man's work shall be made manifest or be made known. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work or every woman's work of what sort it is. My Christian life is not going to go on and on and on and on without being reckoned with. Okay? Now, you may see error in my life and you may correct me or you may not. But one thing is for certain. I'm going to stand before the Almighty God and He is going to correct it or reward it. Okay? And every one of us as individual Christians will stand before God and we will be held accountable or judged according to our works. How you as an individual and me as an individual Christian served Him. How we turned our life completely over to the Lord or not, you see. How I surrender my total being over to the Lord Jesus Christ. How when I said He's the King of my life and the Lord of my life, that the world can see that J. Jones is one who takes the Bible and lives it. Now we all should be saying that. We all should be saying that. Now, I'll, I'll be, just be honest with you. I don't hold that confession up to be true all the time. I fail sometimes. I don't want to and I don't do it willingly. And I repent of it and I ask the Lord to help me to overcome it. You see, even as we speak, my prayer is that I overcome some things in my life right now. When Jesus returns, it's going to be important that we have relied upon Him to help us overcome. If Jesus is doing the building, guess what? You can't help but overcome. Okay? You don't have to say, well... 
I don't know if I can do it, or whatever else. You're going to be able to stand up and say, yes, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords of my life. If Jesus is doing the building. You see, when we are bringing people to Christ through the gospel, we're to teach them before we baptize them. We're to make disciples out of them before we baptize them. We are to make committed people out of those people before we baptize them. They are to be people who have already surrendered their life completely over to the Lord. When they do that, then they are baptized, guess what? They don't bring the old man over into the new man's life. They don't bring the old life over into the new life. But a person that has not done that and been committed to the Lord before they were baptized, they sometimes bring the old life over into the new life. You see? If Jesus did do the building, that isn't going to happen. That's not going to happen. You see, when, I, when we think about Jesus and we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, it ought to be because we love Him with all of our mind, our heart, soul, and strength. That's why we're partaking the Lord's Supper. And it should remind us that we did not deserve the love that He showed us. We did not deserve Him. He did not deserve to die on the cross for us. We did not deserve anything that God has to offer. And it's because of the grace of God it was extended to us. You see, we got that which we did not deserve. Every one of us and the whole world deserved to go to hell and burn for all eternity. Because of the grace of God, He made it that it did not have to be that way. Gosh, I tell you what, there's joy in knowing that there is another place to go to besides hell. <laughs> there's a joy in knowing that there's something else you can work and reach for than, than hell. Okay? If we were taught and we were convinced that the only place there was when we died was to go to hell, how miserable would we be? Yeah. How miserable would we be? And we shouldn't be that miserable now that we know we have a hope in Christ Jesus. We should not be miserable. We should be having joy. We should be happy. We should be excited that Jesus is going to come back one day. And He's going to take His church home with Him. You see? We shouldn't let this here wicked world, this dull and this dark world, persuade us from not serving Christ with everything that we have. Because He's coming back. That's what the devil wants. He wants to get us away from the Lord. He is good enough to do it. He's powerful enough to do it if we'll let Him. You see, so we need to understand that Jesus needs, needs to do the building. There is no other foundation that can be laid. You know, the Bible here mentions gold, silver, pressed stones, wood, hay, stubble. But what about problems in our lives? What about my favorite TV shows? What about my favorite entertainments when I get free time, you know, maybe get a Saturday off? What about things that the world does that the Bible says that we should not be a part of? Notice I said the Bible says we should not be a part of it? Yes. Because when Jesus comes back, the only thing He's going to be pick, picking up is those that have surrendered their lives to Him. And the only way you could possibly do that, my friend, is by studying the Word. You see, the Word separates us from the world. Sometimes there's too much of the world in the church and not enough church in the world. Every person here this morning is a Christian. Every person this morning, God has given the opportunity. Now, if you don't make it to heaven, it's your fault, my friend. God's still giving you the opportunity. Now, it's easier yeah, to, to sometimes sleep, sometimes get tired and weary, sometimes think about what we did last week or what we're going to do next week. Sometimes it's easy for us to worry about problems that are coming our way, worry about our children, our grandchildren, this and that. When all the time, 
We ought to be worrying about what God's going to say to you and me when we stand before Him. There are some things that we can't help in this world. We need to let God take care of it. Make sure that you're ready when Jesus comes back or when you take your last breath. Because if you're not, it's like the rich man in Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, starting with verse 19. He lifted his eyes up in hell in that flame and torment. And he cried out, he begged. Father Abraham sent Lazarus down to dip his water, finger in water and cool off the tip of his tongue. My friends, if we have to go to a place like that, we'll regret. Now listen. We'll regret every time that we heard from God's Word that if there is sin in our life, if there are problems in our life, if there are people in our life that are pulling us away from the Lord, we'll regret that we ever allowed that to happen. We'll regret it. Jesus talks more about that than anything else in the Bible. Because He knows the majority is not going to make it to heaven. And the Bible points that out. In Ephesians chapter 2, if you'll turn over there with me, please. Starting with verse 19. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, and he's talking to the, the church there, telling them, they were once lost, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. But now they have been brought nigh. They're fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. Verse 19. Now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Even here in this world, we as the Lord's church, individually and collectively, are the household of God. We right now are citizens of the eternal kingdom. Right now as, as we're in this life. And the Bible says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Is your life built upon that? Do you know, one of the principal basic things in the New Testament church is to know about Jesus and his apostles. To know who on the day of Pentecost preached the gospel, the very first gospel sermon. And how many people were added to the Lord's church because they repented of their sins and were baptized. That's one of the basic principles of the New Testament church. And every Christian, because God has allowed us time to study and gain that knowledge, should know that. If Jesus would walk through the door right now, or if one of the apostles would walk through the door right now, and come up to every one of us individually, and ask us the question, can you show me in the Bible what foundation the church is built upon? Could you do it? Could you do it? And if Jesus is the apostle now, they're not going to do this, okay? But if they came to that door and they came and looked at me directly, point blank in my eyes, and said, Jay, if you can't show me in the Bible the foundation that the church is built upon, this day... Your name will be taken out of the Lamb's book of life. Then, how would that change the story in your life and in my life? There should be great fear if you can't do that. And if there's not great fear in our lives because of that, my friend, we truly don't believe that Jesus is a Christ. 
And we will continue living our days of our lives until we die, not studying God's Word, not knowing what is in the pages of God's Word. God's Word is not centered around my job, my friend. God's Word is not centered around my kids and my wife and my husband. God's Word is centered around my soul and your soul. The only ones who are going to get to heaven, I'll keep preaching this and preaching this. On the day of Pentecost, there were a million plus people there in Jerusalem. And the same message was preached miraculously by the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And those million plus people heard the same message. But out of those million plus people, only 3,000 people came to the Lord. In the days of Noah, listen my friends, I'm speaking to you as evangelist, not as a friend, a husband, or anything else. You should stand up, take notice. I'm almost 60 years old. I can die any time for sure. And I need to be ready. In Noah's time, for 120 years, Noah preached. God told the people to turn away from their wickedness and turn to Him. And after 120 years, God said, it's enough. And when God had Noah build the ark, God opened the door and He commanded them to go on the boat and all the animals with them. And you know how many got on the boat? Eight people. Out of the whole world. And the question would be, if we were back in Noah's time and God opened the door to the ark, would you and me be the one getting on that ark? Or would we be the ones to be left behind and be destroyed by the flood? That should drive fear in our hearts because of the decisions that we make. I would feel guilty. I would feel guilty if one or more people died today and I'd get to preach this to them. Because that may determine uh, what kind of decision they make before they take their last breath or before Jesus comes back. We live in a society that paints a rosy picture every day that all is well. I went to Haiti, and I want you to know, listen, we met in a church building that was made out of barn roof tin that was rusty and had holes in it, wired together. And it was full. It stunk in there. It was muddy. And when we come together, people were getting on ladders. They were on top of it. They were pulling the tin apart, looking inside. Then people want to hear the Word of God. We in America today, we, we, we want, should want to hear the Word of God no matter what. I hope none of us ever have to die not knowing that you had the opportunity to make things right with God. My dad didn't get to See, he chose not to. And I know according to the Word of God, he lived as a drunkard and he died as a drunkard. My mom died outside of Jesus Christ. My grandmother, whom I love, died outside of Jesus Christ. And I don't care if you've been baptized, if you don't study God's Word, you're going to die outside of Jesus Christ, my friend. Went to Haiti, went to a witch doctor's place. And they had this weird looking tree, they had limbs going everywhere. And these people worshipped it. There was a lady out there saying something, worshipping that tree. And we walked up to her, and we had our interpreters there. We asked her what she's doing. She says, I'm worshipping this tree, I'm worshipping Satan. And we told her, that Jesus is greater than Satan. 
And he says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, yeah, Satan don't care for you. Jesus wants to take you to heaven with him. Satan wants to cause you to go to hell to that lake of fire and burn forever. And she said, that's what I want to do. Then all those little children play, uh, running around there. We ask her, what about these little children? says, I want them to go there too. And we told her, so why don't we just set this tree on fire and throw you in it now? And she backed up and started squawking something. And the men started coming out of the buildings. And we left. You see, when we put her to the real test, we were going to throw her in the fire, she backed off. And I'm afraid today in the church and in the world that until we're put to the real test, we're not going to do what the Bible says. Until we're faced with the flames of hell right this year close to us, we're not going to do what the Bible says. Do you think Jesus would preach it any other way? Do you think the apostles would preach it any other way? It's important that we let Jesus do the building. Our lives, now friends, I'm going to close here. But Jesus is one that can make things happen in our lives. Okay? There's no if and buts about it. He has the power to change your life and my life and make it what He wants it to be. And He will do it if you'll let Him. He'll change your life and make it the way He wants it to be. I'm telling you, there's women in the church that know the Bible from cover to cover. And that's because they got their nose in the book and studied and studied and studied and studied and studied. There's men in the church that knows the book from cover to cover because they got their nose in the book and studied and studied and studied. That was the most important thing to them. Now, if the church is going to go up with the Lord, don't let this society paint that pretty picture for you and think everything's well. If you're going to go to heaven, it's because you studied God's Word. You've allowed God to speak to you and direct your life. Now, that's not a popular message. It doesn't sound good a whole lot. Maybe not be something you want to hear again. I don't know. But if you die, my friend, and you don't go to heaven, it's because you didn't want to hear that. You didn't listen to it. You see, that's why they crucified Jesus. That's why the apostles died for the cause of Christ. Now you have to decide this morning what you're going to do. Now, some people said, would say, that's not a very encouraging message. You beat upon us too bad. I would say it is an encouraging message. You see. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and will. The way that you're living, you turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word until the end. If you are a Christian this morning and the preaching of God's Word is pricking your heart, you know that you're not living as close to the Lord as you need to be. It's because of sin. Sin is the only thing that will keep you from that. And I praise God that he made provision for that. In 1 John 1, 9, for the Christian, if we will confess our sins to him, Jesus, who is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, if we will repent, God will start working in our life again, molding us, making us what he wants us to be.